Hello, thanks for the introduction. As was said, I'm working on my master thesis now, and uh, this is basically a, a side product of it. So my master thesis is, uh, has to do with neural networks, and I was kind of fighting with them. So I was uh, trying to, to learn on actual data, and I was also asking, my uh, I was asking myself the question, is this the data, is it broken, or do, do I do something wrong? So that's uh, basically the history of this, and uh, this is some method I found, and uh, I would like to give you an introduction now to this method. So I will first talk a bit about neural networks, how it's training work, actually, because I don't assume that everyone uh, of you is doing this all day. Um, and then we will come to this automatic learners. After that, uh, or like these automatic learners will be uh, showed as uh, in, in sense of two examples. Uh, is because this is a Python uh, conference, right? Uh, so I found uh, nice Python libraries to do this and um, actually some code, right? So first, how does training a neural network work? Um, I think I assume a lot of you have seen this. This here is this uh, famous neural network, a very basic one. It's already existed 20 years ago, uh, or even longer. And also this data set, uh, which is here uh, exemplified as some MNIST digital, digital recognition data set. And the data comes in, and some prediction comes out. So we have this 10, tenfold uh, output, where each of the predictions become uh, gets some kind of uh, predicted value, so this is the highest, so this is the most probable one for in, in the example of one data point, for example. And when you train this, the, the neural network algorithm is basically iterating over the whole data and adapting weights that are in between those neurons. And uh, then you can lock some kind of loss. And ideally, your loss goes down because it's getting better, and also, you want to have it converged so that you like know when you're finished. Um, so I, I've drawn a little loop, loop here. So you have this model. Basically, the data comes in th into the loop, but it does, does not really change. You have your model, also called the scoring function. And you compute the loss function on your cur current scoring function, and then you change your scoring function by some gradient descent algorithm. So you adapt your model. And the hard thing here is now to get this picture. So this is also, like now it's reversed because it's not loss, it's the accuracy now. So um, this is a nice iteration where the accuracy converges uh, towards some like around 95 or it's a bit overfitting. So the training data here you see um, is kind of getting too, too uh, like better than the validation. So I could have stopped here. Um, but it's a nicer one, and uh, when it does not work, then it looks like this. So when when something uh, you do is not like uh, how it's supposed to be, then then here here in this case it was I think some regularization issue. So the weights that are learned they kind of exploded, and um, then the net neural network could not learn anything. Uh, it it went away, and the the thing was a binary decision, so now uh, we are not really better than a coin toss in this case. And this actually happens like oftentimes. So how to do this systematically? This inner loop is something you can influence. Ah, I forgot this picture. <laughs> it's when you look at too long at loss functions and something like this is happening. Uh, so. There's even a whole blog about loss functions by a famous uh, mich uh, neural network researcher, Andre Carpati. He's collecting these nice pictures. Um, so how to uh, influence this inner loop? It's uh, by means of hyperparameters. I, I already said something that something with the regularization went wrong. This happens into these two points. In these two points, you can either influence your, your gradient your search, the learning rate, for example, would be something um, to adapt, or uh, you can introduce some decay, or you can change your model. Uh, even the architecture would be something that is a hyperparameter. So the number of neurons 
that is uh, depicted here in the middle in the hidden layer, it's flexible. The output is fixed and the input is also fixed, but um, in the middle you can change, you can maybe put more neurons or less. The question is, what is the right number of neurons? No one knows. <laughs> you have to try. So this is then kind of included in an outer loop, this trying. Um, so now here's this small loop we have seen before and the loss function generated and uh, when when it converged then we can extract from one like finished process we can extract the best value so it would be for example this here and store it into our set of experiments. So here was the last experiment and it has like kind of I mean the, the numbers it's just an illustration don't look at the numbers but um, the thing is now we know this was our currently best set of hyperparameters um, which we want to try. So as a researcher or as a like machine learner, data scientist, uh, you have to adapt the parameters. You can do this by different means. Um, the most uh, like the most stupid or uh, the most simple one is the gra uh, grid search where you just list your parameters and you try everything. But the thing is that it explodes a lar really large, um, a really, really fast. So, I mean, what I didn't mention so far, uh, training such a network um, can take like, for example, uh, up to a couple of days or even weeks if, they, if you have a lot of data, then the iteration uh, is like very expensive computation, so one experiment is really ex expensive. This is a key um, key thing to um, mention here, because uh, for like um, support vector machine or something, when when the data is uh, like not too large, then it can just compute the value. But here you have to run and run and run, and then you see okay, it converges. So when you try crit search, then it takes takes too long. You cannot like when you have a couple of uh, hyperparameters, then you can get of it can get to millions of uh, combinations. Then another approach, which is really famous, is random search. So you basically um, just be lucky. Uh, so you you run uh, these experiments that maybe for for example when you don't have so much data, it takes an hour, then you can run 20 a day and you just let it run for a couple of days and see then what what was the best so far. Very famous also grad student search. This is basically what I'm doing. So I'm the poor master student who has to tune these networks by any means. I mean, I'd, I'm not saying that these that these combinations are really separate, so you can combine them. Um, but uh, this would be uh, the more like human approach. And then, because this is so difficult, most people don't really do it anymore. They appeal to expert. That means uh, you can like go to the uh, to some famous uh, neural network libraries and download finished models. It's basically take off the shelf and uh, use them because they're already trained and uh, the issues that I explained are not existing so much anymore because uh, they already converged and you can the assumption here is that your data is similar to the data they trained it with. You can reuse them. That's a very famous approach and I guess if you are dealing with neural networks you have done this. Um, yeah, what I wanted to mention here is just a connection to tomorrow's to uh, tomorrow's talk. What uh, some library that is similar to the one that Blue Yonder uh, just explained. Uh, it's Python Parameter Exploration Toolkit. This just want to advertise tomorrow's talk by Robert Meyer. It's a cool uh, library which I also introduced here in this grad student search. Um, so. The consequence of all this is now we would like to have automatic search. Um, the benefits would be then that you don't have to learn, you don't have to become an expert of all these parameters, but you can um, 
use some kind of a nomadic search. Um, and for like researchers, this also uh, is beneficial because you can uh, reduce some kind of biases. If you're um, inventing a new method or thinking about a new method, then it's like natural that you're subjective that you to believe in it and uh, you put much more effort into uh, one model that is yours and the others that are the competitors say kind of okay it's fine so they give weaker results so it's very subjective and then in the end you have 10 papers with 10 methods and everyone is saying theirs is the best um, this automatic approach would be like solve this problem a bit more um, because it would be fairer and also the reproduction uh, like of results would be a bit easier but I found it I w was a bit um, I found it kind of curious that I that this there are no really known ma um, automatic approaches so when I stumbled upon this I had the feeling that nobody uses them so that's why I'm standing here and adver adver advertising them so I hope you will soon also uh, look into this and then maybe, I mean, okay, we don't want to like reduce our jobs, but <laughs> maybe a bit more automatization would be great. Going to an example, I'm using Keras here, which is just some Python neural network library. And um, what you're seeing here is a like very basic um, neural network as before. It has like two hidden layers and uh, one output layer. And what I want you to look at here is these, these hyperparameters. So for example, this number is the 256 units in the hidden layer would be something you don't know if this is the right number. So we want to have a choice. We want to try around. This now um, is an example of one of the libraries, Hyperas is really tied to the specific machine, uh, to the specific neural networks library. Um, so you can just put it in here and it's really easy. Mm. And this algorithm, algorithm is a bit, a bit better than, than grid search because it uh, kind of tries to uh, find some combinations that, that make sense. Um, so I, I would call it grid search on steroids, um, but it's not yet Bayesian optimization. We're getting to that point. So in in this kind of, uh, I mean, I cannot really show you the, the algorithm because I, I did not look into the code, but um, just show you examples of what's, what's possible here. So I think this is a really straightforward, flexible syntax. You can just replace your question marks where you're not sure by some some choice functions and then the library is taking takes care of it but the problem is that the parameters are like um, interdependently um, run so your experiments are just run from top to bottom you could even run them all in parallel but um, you don't learn anything in each step what I would like to have is an expert system so a system that gets like smarter every every experiment to that um, the, to this point uh, there is then a Bayesian approach so if you maybe you remem remember this from math or have seen this like in the other machine learning methods base rule uh, so we have a model M and um, some base uh, some some basic assumptions it's the prior and uh, by seeing how like doing a maximum likelihood approach or likely you're looking looking at your likelihood you can compute the posterior so you can you can see how likely your model is given the data you have so and the cool thing is ab about this that it's kind of iterative so you you can put more data and then learn more so um, and now, how does this apply to our uh, problem? It's basically, we change some letters and then it totally makes sense, right? Um, we want to learn a function 
which is now this outer loop function that I showed you. So um, the function is depend on the hyperparameters and the data is the experiments you run. So you have some assumption of your function and um, again this likelihood function and then you can compute your um, like experiment expectation, so to say, your output um, based on the data you have run before. And you can, uh, when you increase your, your t, when you, when you go forward and produce more experiments, then you, your, um, I'm, I mean, I will show you a picture, right? <laughs> um, this would be the f that I showed. And the two points here is the d, so the data. We already, um, the dashed line is our goal function that we don't know. And um, the full stroke line is kind of the mean of our estimation. And then what, what is uh, particularly interesting on this, on this Bayesian approach is that you have some uncertainty measure. So you, you see here we know something and here we know something and we assume if we change a little uh, on the data then not so much change, so we can be certain that it's kind of near um, the point where we have uh, that we have seen before. But if we go away from this point, so the x-axis is kind of the hyperparameter that we can change. Um, if we change the hyperparameter uh, like a lot, then we are uncertain, so it could be anything. And this method now does ask a question at which point, at which hyperparameter do we learn the most? Or do we have the highest expectation of improvement? For this, then there's like a, a another function, uh, which is called the acquisition function. And we look at the maximum here, um, to which is kind of what the algorithm computes to get our new hyperparameter to try in the next experiment. So in the third, experiment, oops, uh, yeah, I will explain this soon. Uh, so in the third experiment, we try this point and then we can see, okay, we're certain here now. The headline says it's a Gaussian process. This is kind of the math that is behind this whole thing. So it was with this slide here, the uncertainty is measured by, by Gaussian um, distributions. This is basically because it's easy to compute um, and we can like do nice uh, marginalization and computations that are necessary to to this. Um, so that's where the name comes from and the math comes from. I won't go into detail here so much to not bore you. Um, just a new thing to mention, like uh, iterating this again. Your your fourth step would be this here. Um, to give you an intuition, what this picture means, just if you, if I would ask you, you don't see this like acquisition function, and if I would ask you what should I try next, then it makes sense to try here, because you want to maximize this function in this case, and um, so there is like this boundary is is uh, going up a bit, so our chance to increase our probability of improvement is the highest. Whereas if you look along this line here, it's always kind of below. I should have drawn a dot dash dashed line here to visualize it, but it doesn't ma not make sense so much to try here. Maybe here it could be because I mean we can see this. It's modeled, but this is the best point. Um, so the another library, the next library um, that implements this algorithm is called Spearmint can look it up, it's linked in the end. And um, it, it works with configuration files, which is a nice, nice thing because uh, it's not necessarily um, uh, tied to neural networks. It's, you can use it for every parameterized model um, that you want, if you want to. So the researcher that um, proposed this paper uh, had an example where he tried this on boiling eggs. So they did kind of their parameters, uh, the cooking time and um, like how hot the water is before or uh, not, 
or how old the egg is, and all these parameters they, they tried around and just took notes. So it's not even ha it doesn't even have to be on the computer. Um, that's a major point here because like there's maybe a lot of other algorithms that are taking a long time to compute, and you want to really reduce your amount of experiments you have you you want to do to get a nice result. So, yeah, as we can see here, in the case of neural networks, we have the dropout parameter, which is between 0 and 1, and the density, which can be like three values. Um, so, as I already explained, this can be applied to anything that has parameters. Um, and this Bayesian approach gives you kind of the, like, um, yeah, it's on on a certain in a certain uh, kind of range, it's optimal. <laughs> so you really reduce your your time to a good result. Um, uh, of of course, there's no free lunch. We have uh, the problem that this Gaussian process computation can really take a long time if you have uh, a lot of parameters because you have to marginalize everything out. Um, to to model this, uh, so this acquisition function you have seen, we in in the example it was only one dimensional to illust illustrate, but in in the real world it's like hyper dimensional, um, and yeah, it it's just like you have to think about it if it's worth trying this process or if you try around with random search, it's a it's a fair baseline. Um, to show you a bit of data, I did not do too many experiments, but um, if we uh, this sample code I showed you, when it's when it's run on on the MNIST data set, then we can kind of see that the accuracy increases. And um, maybe let me tell you the story of this expert that tries or this grad student uh, that tries to learn something how how neural networks work and he can also use this toolbox mm, to get a better feeling for it because this toolbox is a guided search and then you can make observations and maybe make like this this posteriors that are mathematically can try to explain them for yourself so if i see here hidden neurons were in the in the non no tuned case like which was the beginning were 256 but obviously it seems like more neurons is good and i mean this is something uh, everyone that has some experience with neural network knows but this is the first step is just a toy example right and also some observation would be okay maybe if you have more neurons then uh, increase dropout which which is some kind of regularization is also good because otherwise your many neurons um, uh, tend, tend to overfit. So the storyline here is that these are things you can explain and uh, maybe you can even, with these libraries, you can even learn things you didn't know before. This is something you, um, you could have known, but there are maybe other things when, when you make this search larger, then you see things that you didn't know before. That's, I think, a very nice um, property. So, as a conclusion, I'm a bit fast. <laughs> um, you should try Bayesian optimization on your next experiment, on your next project, if you have something uh, that is similar to it. So, for example, neural networks or something that is um, really um, computationally expensive and has a lot of hyperparameters. And um, yeah, the papers from Jasper Snook and uh, Bextra. Uh, show that they can really, they did it on um, like less toy examples than me, they did it on large neural networks with uh, competitive um, results on the ImageNet competi competition for example, and they could tune the, the model to uh, better than expert, so they could kind of win the competition with it. Um, and of course, Hyperopt and Spamant were just two examples, but 
out of the Python world. There is another uh, Python library that, that I discovered then, which is trying to unify these approaches. So there's a third five, uh, w algorithm that is working well, which is called SMAC. And you can find all of them uh, conclude, um, tied together here. And of course, as I said before, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but I think this could still uh, be beneficial. Um, so, thanks for your attention. <laughs> oh. So, are there any questions? Um, so the question was, how did I define the acquisition function? Uh, that is, oops, something. Um, that's a good question because I mean this is kind of something you have to decide. So now we had this no free lunch thing. This is kind of a hyperparameter. Uh, yeah, uh, that is, for example, uh, would be. I, I did not show the math. Uh, you have to look into the papers to see the math actually, actu to see the actual math. But it's some kind of marginalization, your expected improvement. Um, it's kind of defined mathematically. I can show you if you want later. Um, so they just say, how much chance have I got here to imp improve to the thing that I have before? So then you add a neuron at that point? Or if I add a neuron? I'm not sure if you, you just calculate the function at that point or what? Um, yeah, so this acquisition function then gives me this point, and this is basically a set of hyperparameters. Yeah. And then I run a whole uh, neural network process. So then I, for example, it says you should use so and so many neurons, or, and uh, this and this uh, um, learning rate. And then I put this into my inner loop that I showed before. So I, uh, these are the hyperparameters I'm talking about, and this inner loop it's then running, and then I get a new result, and I can update my <coughs> my function that I'm was expecting here. So I, the update is then after the n the whole neural network trained one time, for example, for a couple of hours, then I get a new data point. Okay. Yes. So the question was if that's a chicken egg problem because uh, Gaussian processes have a lot of parameters. Um, so I think the thing gets a bit more abstract. So the, the tendency is there. I also asked myself that when I was uh, looking here. Uh, but I think um, you can yeah, basically get a bit more away from it. Um, and the, the whole parameters of the Gaussian processes are uh, integrated out. So this is the thing that is very expensive. Um, of course, we have to define a prior or something, some pre-assumptions. But um, yeah, that's a choice you have ma to make. Um, the one of the authors of this of this method uh, said this would be then this ground assumption, in instead of having lots of different parameters. So the question was if this method would help in um, like um, that you don't run an experiment that's then really like messed up, um, if I rephrase it like this. And I think you still have to go into some way of like accepting that your, your experiment goes in the wrong direction sometimes to learn new things about the parameters. For example, if you imagine this grad student search, like you're trying around, um, 
then you try something you try the boundaries and you want to see how it behaves there and then you can but you, what you can do then is like see okay this really goes uh, away and then you can stop so the experiment is not so expensive in this case um, more expensive and more interesting it's in the areas where it's define differences yes in the back Uh, oh, wrong direction. So, this. Oh. So, this slide. So, the question was, uh, what does the dropout 1.0 mean? That isn't that the, like everything is dropped. Um, I think you could be right. <laughs> That's <laughs> I have to look into that. Uh, that is. So, question wa or like explanation uh, was that then the initialization weights would be used. Um, I I'm not sure what happens then. Uh, I I'd have. Yeah, sure. I mean, so these are all the same like very very similar results because i have a really easy problem here and also uh, i mean this is just to kind of see if it works or not so it's kind of toy very toy example and but as you pointed out this we have we have to look into this dropout thing thanks <laughs> more questions Question was if this, what has this to do with Python? If this is template variables and uh, where the outer loop is. So uh, you're right. It's it's like outside of this, and um, the Hyperas library then uh, transform this code, transforms this code into actual Python, and it you can it prints it when it starts running. So it's basically replaced, and then. Uh, putting in the different options step by step. So you can't run it without Hyperis anymore? Yeah, you can't run it without Hyperis anymore and um, that's what I meant by this point. I, did not, I don't know if I explained it. strongly tied to the model. So, I mean, also the names are really right. Keras, Hyperas, so it's a decision you make, I think. Uh, um, I also thought about that and I think it's like thing about the library specificity mm. maybe maybe you could still parameterize it yourself and then put your template variables somewhere else if you want but that would be ugly as well <laughs> more questions Time. okay Thank yeah you for